I'm Josh Young, and this is Act 2 of the Crash Course on Optics. Let's start talking about aberration. So we discussed in the uh, first act the idea of um, refractive index, but we acted as if it were the same refractive index, the same impedance uh, to movement for all wavelengths of light. And it turns out that that's not true. Um, the refractive index is effectively higher for short wavelength light than for long wavelength light. Uh, so if we have white light coming into a uh, lens, the short wavelengths are going to be focused closer to the lens uh, than the long wavelengths are. In the case of the eye, uh, the short wavelengths, um, you know, in, 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 an, in an emetropic, pseudophagic, non-accommodating, optically perfect eye, um, the short wavelengths are going to be focused anterior to the retina and the long wavelengths posterior to the retina with the sort of yellows being on, on the retina. Um, and we can employ this uh, clinically in the, the duochrome test. But I'll ask you this. So you know that, um, that blue is a shorter wavelength than green. Um, why is it that we don't use blue and red? That certainly they, they would have more of a separation than, than green and red. And the answer is that, of course, they, they, they do. But they don't center on, um, on the retina. In order to get things that are equidistant to the retina, we actually need red and green. Now, the problem is, is that green is closer to the uh, peak sensitivity wavelength uh, of the retina than red is. And that's why the green side always looks brighter uh, than, the, than the red side does. And that's why when you do the, the duochrome test, uh, you want to ask patients not which side's easier to read or which side's brighter, but which side has the darker, sharper letters. Anyway, this is an emetropic patient uh, performing the uh, duochrome test. Uh, green and red are going to be equidistant to the retina, equally blurry. This is the case of a myopic patient uh, in which um, both uh, rays of light converge anterior to the retina, but the red is closer to the retina. So uh, in an uncorrected myope or an undercorrected myope, uh, red is going to be closer to the, the, the retina. The red letters, the, 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 the black letters with the red background are going to have um, more definition uh, than the letters with the green background. With a hypropic patient or with an overcorrected myope, the green is going to be sharper because it's closer to the retina, even as both of these wavelengths are focusing posterior to the retina. We're going to revisit the, the chromatic aberration thing um, later on. Okay, this is just a really ridiculously busy slide, and I apologize for that. I do. Um, so the, the, the power of a lens is equal to the change in indices, delta n. Is, I'm sorry, this is for a plano convex lens, so one side's plano. Um, it is equal to delta n over r. Um, if it were a biconvex lens, then you can view it as just sort of two plano convex lenses that are back to back. Anyway, plano convex lens, delta n over r. Uh, this is um, a, a glass lens in air. Uh, delta n is 0.5. Uh, the radius of curvature in meters. We're done with prism land now, so we're only working in, in meters. The radius, uh, 0 0.05 meters, um, means that the dioptric power is 10 diopters. What if we put this lens in water? So what's going to change is the uh, index of the, the medium, and that is going to um, mean that the delta n is uh, going to be less. So 1.5 minus 1.33 gives us 3.4 diopters um, for this lens in, in water. So, you know, if you were to take an IOL, which is calculated for its power in aqueous, and just put it in air on a, on a lens meter, you are going to get a much higher value um, because it's calculated uh, for a, 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 a delta n in which the, the, the medium in which it sits is um, basically 1.33. Okay, special topic, the Fermat principle. Uh, okay, so um, we're going to talk about the movement of light in air and in water. 
and in air, there is less resistance to movement. It's going to move faster. The speed of light is going to be faster in air than in water. Um, similarly, uh, in uh, air, water, and glass, uh, the light is going to move most slowly in the medium with an index that is highest. So how, how does this play out in uh, real actual life? So here are, of course, two candles. And uh, we know the, the paths that the ray of light takes. The ray of light passing through the optical center of the lens will emerge from the lens undeviated. Um, so it, it's taking a shorter geometric path. But you see it's spending more of its path in glass where its speed is slower. So if we actually plot out uh, what the uh, paths and timing of the rays of light are, we see that there it encounters the glass, slows down, and the rays of light start at the same time in the object and end at the same time, converge simultaneously at the image, even though they're taking different paths. A Fermat principle, or Fermat. Let's talk about vergence. Um, there are four questions that you can be asked generally in a uh, simple lens object image problem. Um, and uh, they are, um, well, we'll see later on where, where, what, what they are. Vergence is a description of the shape of the wavefront of the light coming off of the candle. But we're not going to worry about that. We're, we're going to view vergence uh, as a, just sort of an abstract concept, where vergence is the inverse in meters uh, from where we are interested to where the rays of light converge. Here, the rays of light converge at the flame. And when we're one meter from the flame, the rays of light, if we're sitting one meter from the flame, then the rays of light are converging one meter to our left. The inverse of uh, that is one. If the convergence is to the left of our frame of reference, so in this case, our frame of reference is the outside of that outer circle. If the convergence is to the if the convergence is to the left of our frame of reference, then the vergence is a negative number. If the convergence is to the right, it's got a positive number. So same rays of light. When those rays of light are one half of a meter from the candle, the vergence is two to the left, so it's going to be minus two. And uh, then when the same rays of light are one meter from the candle, the vergence is going to be minus one for the reasons we have described. OK, so let's talk about uh, the vergence at uh, these different alphabet points here. Uh, so at A, the rays of light converge where? A quarter of a meter to the left. One over a quarter of a meter is four. To the left means minus. So it's going to be minus four. One half minus two. Three quarters is going to be four thirds, which is 1.33 minus, and one, as, as we saw, is uh, one. Now, you'll frequently encounter uh, problems um, on the boards that look something like this, or O caps. Um, so let's take uh, our point that is 10 centimeters uh, to the left. Again, I don't know if this shows my arrow, but I'm pointing here at, 10, at the minus 10 centimeter mark. So what is the vergence there? Well, it's easy to get fooled. Because minus 10, you think, well, 1 over that, 1 over that in meters is going to be 10. So is this going to be a vergence of minus 10? But of course, that's, that's not true. The, the trick here is that this baseline is numbered with respect to where the lens is. That's not the way that we calculate vergence. We calculate vergence by where the rays of light converge. So the first thing that we're going to do is renumber this baseline. So this is our appropriate numbering that measures the distance to where the convergence is. So that spot that used to be minus 10 is now minus 40 because it's 40 centimeters to where the rays of light converge, or 0.4 meters. And the vergence at that point is going to be 1 over 0.4, which is 2.5. And because the convergence is to the left, it's going to be minus, minus 2.5 at that point. What is the vergence of the rays of light just as they're about to enter the lens? Well, they converge half a meter to the left. Half a meter means an absolute value of the vergence of 2. To the left means minus, 
so it's going to be minus 2. What about the vergence of the rays of light just as they exit the lens? So where do they converge? Uh, they converge to the right, and they converge to the right 75 centimeters, or, or 0.75 meters, and one over that is 1.33, and because it's to the right, it's going to have a positive value, plus 1.33. So don't let the baselines fool you. You need to make sure that everything is with respect to where the rays of light converge. Incidentally, if the uh, virgins coming into the lens was minus 2 and the virgins coming out of the lens was plus 1.33, what was the contribution of the lens? Well, the contribution of the, of the lens is th plus 3.33 uh, because minus 2 plus 3.33 equals 1.33. Okay, so um, the the questions that you can be asked with these virgins problem that we can solve with with virgins are um, where the uh, where the objects and images are and what the power of the lens is. That's all sort of one question, and the other question is is the image inverted or upright? We're gonna excuse me. The, 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 that, that, is, that is not true. We're going to be dealing with inverted and upright later on. Uh, it, 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 it's where, where these, these things are. You cannot solve for inverted and upright just using virgins. The other thing that you can tell with virgins is whether something is real or virtual, and we will discuss that, um, I think, a couple slides from now. So uh, what is the virgins coming into this lens? Well, just as the rays of light encounter the lens, um, they are one-tenth of a meter. Remember, we're always going to use meters now. One-tenth of a meter. Uh, the inverse of that is, is 10. So it's going to be 10 is the absolute value of the virgins. And because they converge to the left just as they're about to enter the lens, uh, the virgins is, is negative. So it's minus 10 coming in. Um, what is the virgins coming out? Well, that's, that's easy. Right? So the virgins coming out is equal to the virgins coming in plus the contribution of, of the lens. So it's minus 10 coming in plus 15 for the lens. It's going to be plus 5 coming out. What does a virgins of plus 5 mean? With your eyes closed, I'm not even looking at the slides, I'm looking at the screen. A virgins of plus 5 always means the same thing. It means that the rays of light converge one fifth of a meter and plus means to the right. So a virgins plus 5, one fifth of a meter to the right. What does the virgins of minus 2 mean? Minus 2, 2 means half a meter, minus to the left. Rays of light converge one half of a meter to the, to the left. You don't need any visual cues to tell you where the rays of light converge if you know what the virgins is. Anyway, this is a plus lens, uh, a uh, convex lens. What about here? What about this case? Um, so uh, th there, there, are, um, there, there, there are two different problems here, right? Let's take the problem where the candle on the left is our object and the candle on the right is our image. So the object rays hit the lens with a virgence of what? Well, it is the, this object is 20 centimeters to the left of the lens. 20 centimeters uh, means uh, a, a virgence of 5. To the left means minus. So it's going to be minus 5 coming into the lens. Where is the image formed? If the image is the smaller candle, uh, the image is formed only a tenth of a meter from the lens. A tenth of a meter means a virgence of 10. To the left means minus, so it's minus 10. So this lens is encountering rays of light coming in at minus 5, and the rays of light exiting are minus 10. So what is the contribution of the lens? Well, it must be minus 5. Let's take a completely different and unrelated problem on the same slide. What if the object is that smaller candle to the right? So that object is going to uh, produce rays of light that are going to encounter the lens with a virgence of minus 10. They're going to exit the lens with a virgence of minus 5. That's why we're able to get the image that's 20 centimeters to the left. Minus 10 coming in, minus 5 coming out. What is the dioptric power of that lens? It must be plus 5. Okay. Real or virtual is the easiest thing. The, um, as long as we have the rays of light moving from the left side of the page or the screen to the right side, 
um, then it is always the case that uh, the in a simple object lens image problem that the order should be object lens image. If one of those things is offside, it's virtual. If it's not offsides, it's real. So if we have an object on the left, that's real. If we have an image on the right of the lens, that's real. What about here? Here we have an object that is real because it's to the left of the lens and an image that is virtual because it's to the left of the lens, it's offsides. And this will work with everything. You don't have to worry about can you project it or not project it. This will always give you the right answer with real or virtual. So conjugate planes is also a very, very easy concept. I know this will come as a great shock, but if we were to substitute another thing for that candle on the left, it would still image on the right in the same place. So if we took out the candle and we put in a lizard, we would get an image of a lizard on the right. So it's not anything magical about the candle. What's magical is the planes. So these are called conjugate planes. This is uh, an example from our other problem with conjugate planes. OK, so a special topic here. Let's talk about reduced virgins. So we, we have this image here that we've uh, seen plenty of, uh, which has the object on the left and the image on the right. And uh, we can solve for this uh, saying that the incoming virgins, u, plus the power of the lens is equal to the outgoing virgins, v. But that is a very, well, let, let, let's, let's, let's break this out. This is the formula for it, the sort of general formula for it, um, which is uh, index uh, 1 over the distance of the object, that's what the O is, um, plus the power of the lens, lens maker's formula, delta n over r, is equal to uh, the index of the second medium over the distance to the image. And if we're in air, this is, of course, very easy because both n1 uh, and uh, bo bo both the, you know, this should really be n3. Oh, that's my problem. But the, the u is going to be equal to 1 over o, and the v is going to be equal to 1 over i. Uh, so that's just our, our regular formula where we're saying that the diopter is equal to 1 over. But what if the second medium is not air, but is, let's say, aqueous? Let's say that this is a uh, cornea or some other membrane that's curved, um, that uh, separates um, uh, the area on the left from the area on the right. How do we solve for uh, this? So in, in this case, N2 on the far right is going to be 1.33 because it's water. You can simplify this to just the image distance is what the image distance would have been times N sub 2. Right, so let's go back to that for just one sec. If we were doing this in air, then V would be equal to 1 over I, 1 over the distance to the image. But instead, it's equal to N2 over the distance to the image. Or I'm just going to say it is the virgins in air, what it would have been, which is 1 over i times n2. So reduced virgins uh, on the right uh, is, is the, the image distance is going to be um, what the image distance would have been in air times the index of refraction of the medium. So if the distance would have been, let's say, 10 centimeters, but we're in water now, uh, it's going to be 13.3 centimeters, right? Because uh, index of refraction of water is 1.33. It's not hard. It's, it's a little weird, but it's not hard. OK, these are the conjugate planes in a direct ophthalmoscope. And I'm taking the case here of an emetropic patient and an emetropic ophthalmologist uh, so that the, uh, uh, the virgins of the rays of light between the two eyes is, in fact, 0. They're parallel. All that the ophthalmoscope is doing is acting as a coaxial light source. Um, and the conjugate planes are the patient's retina and the observer's retina. I mean, that's the objective is to get a look at the patient's retina. So those planes have to be conjugate. What about in the case of an indirect? Well, it turns out that there are three conjugate planes. There is the plane of the patient's retina and the plane of the ophthalmologist's retina. I mean, that's the goal. 
Uh, but there's also uh, an additional plane. Um, there's an aerial image formed by the 20 diopter lens. Uh, and that aerial image is formed in space uh, somewhere between the patient's eye and the observer's eye. Where is it exactly? We can actually figure this out. If the patient is emetropic, then the rays of light, I mean, what, what does what does emetropy mean? Emetropy means that rays of light coming into the eye with a vergence of zero will be imaged appropriately on the patient's retina. That means that if we illuminate the, the, the retina, a, a point on the patient's retina will emerge from the patient's eye with a vergence of, of zero. It's the exact same path, just going backwards and forwards. Those zero vergence rays encounter the 20 diopter lens that we're holding up in front of the patient's eye and will take on a vergence of 20 diopters and therefore will converge um, five centimeters, one twentieth of, of a meter to the right uh, of the patient's lens or, or closer to the observer's eye. Uh, than the lens that we're holding by five centimeters. Obviously, if the patient's myopic or hyperopic, it's going to be a different distance. The um, indirect ophthalmoscope then has an ad that allows us to uh, see the this aerial image without having to strain ourselves too badly. So three conjugate planes here. You know, there's there's another set of conjugate planes with the indirect, and it, it's it's this. It's the light filament and the patient's pupil because we're, we're, we're trying to get all of the rays of light through the patient's pupil. And in this case, we are using the 20 diopter lens as what we call a, a condensing lens to um, get uh, all the rays of light uh, into the very small pupil. So this is a second set of, of conjugate planes shown in red there. Okay, let's, let's learn some vocab here. Um, the primary focal point is the point from which rays of light emanating and encountering the lens will emerge from the lens with the zero vergence, will emerge from the lens parallel. The uh, primary focal point of a convex lens, of a plus lens, is to the left of the lens. The primary focal point of a minus lens is going to be to the right of the lens. So again, it's the point in space from which rays of light emanating from that point will emerge from the lens with a vergence uh, of zero parallel. With the minus lens, it's a little bit harder to, to conceptualize because, of course, a minus lens is contributing uh, minus vergence uh, to, the, to the rays of uh, light. That means that the rays of light have to have some positive vergence coming into the minus lens in order to emerge with a vergence of zero. So we're extrapolating those converging uh, rays of light to see where the, the, the primary focal point is. And that primary focal point, as I said, is to the right of the minus lens. Primary focal points are of a lot less interest to us in, in clinical medicine than secondary focal points. So the secondary focal point is where the rays of light converge if they enter the lens parallel, uh, if they enter the lens with a, with a zero vergence. So with a plus lens, it's going to be to the right. With a minus lens, it's going to be to the left. Uh, and uh, it's drawn as uh, F prime, uh, F with a little prime mark, even though it's the secondary focal point. So secondary focal point. What does this look like with the eye? A, a, a hyperopic patient, uh, rays of light are converging insufficiently. There's not enough plus power in the front of the eye. That's why these patients need plus lenses. Uh, a, the rays of light converge posterior to the retina. In a myopic eye, they converge anterior to the retina. This is an overplussed eye. So what if we can get rays of light coming into that overplus eye, that myopic eye, with a negative vergence? Um, can we then displace them onto the retina? And the answer is yes, of course. Uh, if they come in with a negative vergence, uh, they can image appropriately on the patient's retina. And the point at which this happens is what's called the, the far point. And uh, experien experientially, subjectively, uh, this far point is the furthest point that the myopic patient can see unaided without spectacles. He can see closer if he accommodates, uh, but the, the far point is the furthest point that he can see. The far point uh, for uh, a hyperopic eye is, is in back of the eye. It's not that the patient can see that, but that we're extrapolating from these converging rays uh, that converge enough to allow the um, rays of light to image on the patient's retina. I'm going to show you something that's a little bit 
simplified here. I'm going to take a shortcut that I'm going to correct some slides down the road, but let's let's go with it for uh, now. If this patient's far point is half of a meter from his eye, then this is a patient who wants a vergence of minus two hitting his eye. We can do that by either having him look only at objects that are half a meter from his eye, or by putting a lens up that will produce a vergence of minus two on the patient's eye. Now you can think of this as, as a minus two lens, and we would call this patient a, a minus two myope. It's not exactly a minus two lens, but clinically, in this case, it's a, it's a minus two lens. We're going to look at cases later on in which it's a, it's a little bit different. So what, what is the association of this lens with the patient's far point? Well, the far point is co-located with the secondary focal point for the correcting lens. The correcting lens has to have its secondary focal point in the same spot as the patient's far point. Um, okay, what about a hyperopic patient? Same thing, the uh, uh, secondary focal point has to be uh, co-located with the patient's far point. Uh, by the little break here, we're going to talk about a special topic and that special topic is distortion. I know we're still on that ichthyoptics thing, right? So uh, this is a, a fish, FYI, this is a ray fin fish, unlike the lobe fin fish that I showed you, the coelacanth. Uh, and um, we're gonna be looking at, at distortion and as beautiful as the fish is, we're gonna have the easiest time telling what sort of distortion it is by looking actually at the edge of the, of the picture. Um, the, or the 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 horizon uh, of of the of the picture, which in this case is uh, nice and flat. The distortions that we're going to be describing are barrel and pin cushion. I always have an issue with this because all the pin cushions that I've seen look like barrels. But let's let's go with this. So in barrel distortion, um, the horizon is curved so that the edges of the 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 horizon, the left and right edges bow down and the center bows up or bows up. In a pin cushion, it's the opposite. The, uh, the horizon bows in towards the uh, center. So what, what can generate these, these things? Um, in a myopic lens, uh, a, 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 a myopic a minus lens will produce some minification. And the amount of minification, you can think this through sort of from Prentice's rule, is more obvious at the edge of the image. So the edge of the image is drawn in, in this case it's the corners of the image, which are drawn in more uh, than, um, than the, the, the middle of the image. So minus lens is going to produce a barrel distortion. The pin cushion is created when there is more magnification at those outside corners than there is in the center. That magnification is produced by plus lenses. So once more, uh, here is our nice fish, and we're going to induce some distortion. And what is the distortion that's here? So this is distortion in which those corners are being drawn out. The center is bowing in. This is pin cushion distortion. And we described what sort of lenses produce pincushion. They are plus lenses, okay? More magnification out in the corners than in the center. That's why they're drawn out like that. This is obviously barrel distortion. The horizon bows up centrally. There's more minification in the corners. The corners are drawn in more. And that is produced by minus lenses. Okay, let's move on to our next big topic, which is astigmatism. And we're going to be talking about power crosses. Uh, we're going to be talking about the image in the uncorrected eye, uh, astigmatism types. And then we're going to circle back and revisit anisometropic anisophoria. OK, we're going to now begin the multimedia portion of this presentation. And for that, I need a visual aid that you need to get, which is a sheet of paper. So let's get a sheet of paper. And we're going to roll it into a cylinder. We're going to pinch the cylinder with our second and third digits. Uh, and let me have you pinch that vertically. I'm going to have you then pinch the other end of the cylinder, 
perpendicularly to that uh, with uh, two of the fingers of your other hand. And what you have created now is the conoid of sturm. And the middle part of this conoid, the cross section through this middle area here, is a circle. It's called the circle of least confusion. The cross sections where you're pinching it with your fingers, those cross sections are lines. They're the two focal lines. In the conoid close to, but not exactly at the line, we're going to have an oval. And the long axis of that oval is going to coincide with a closer focal line. So in uh, the, the cross section that's close to the fingers that are being held vertically, uh, it is going to be a, an oval with its long axis that is vertical. Okay, more words. Uh, with the rule means that k's, that the cornea is steep uh, at 90, plus or minus 20. You know, if someone is uh, has a steep axis of 80 or 100, that's, that's still with the rule. Uh, flat at 180, the plus cylinder aligns with where the cornea is steep. Um, so the plus cylinder uh, would be, if the plus cylinder is at 90 plus or minus 20, that is with the rule. Or if the minus cylinder is at, the minus cylinder aligns with the flat axis of the cornea. Excuse me. The minus cylinder axis aligns with the flat meridian of the cornea, uh, and that is at 180. Against the rule, obviously, is just the opposite of everything I just said. And uh, oblique uh, astigmatism is anything outside of, of, of that 20. Or if you want to be pretentious, oblique. So this is a power cross. And this is a power cross of a minus 4 sphere. And this minus 4 sphere has got uh, minus 4 as its power any way that you slice it. So if we slice the lens vertically, if we say how much, of, how much power do we get uh, vertically in this minus 4 lens, it's minus 4, and horizontally it's minus 4 too. It's kind of what the definition of a sphere is. This is a cylinder, and this is a plus cylinder. And the plus cylinder is producing plus 5 horizontally. That means that this cylinder has its curvature horizontally. This cylinder has got no power vertically. That means that the cylinder is not curved in the vertical direction. So if we think of the cylinder as a can of soda, is this can of soda standing up or is the can of soda on its side? This can of soda is standing up because the cross-section through that can of soda horizontally is going to be curved, in this case plus 5. The cross-section of the can of soda vertically, sagittally, is going to be 0. It's going to look like a rectangle when we take our, our cross-section. Um, and so this is a plus cylinder. This is a, a can of soda that is standing vertically. What is the axis of rotation of that cylinder? Well, the axis of rotation of that cylinder as a 3D solid is vertical. And we describe a cylinder's orientation by describing its axis, not by describing the meridian where its, uh, where its power is actually acting. So this is a plus cylinder with a vertical axis, with an axis of 90. Let's combine these. So this is our minus 4 lens on the left. And we're making a union with our uh, plus 5 cylinder on the right. And we can write that union out as minus 4 plus 5 axis 90. We can then sum these and make a total power cross. And that power cross is going to be minus 4 vertically, because minus 4 plus 0 is minus 4, is going to be plus 1 horizontally. Minus 4 uh, plus plus 5 is equal to plus 1. Let's look at this total power cross. So it's, it is what we've written out. Um, but are there other ways we, we, could, we could break it down? Well, we, we could describe this uh, just as a combination of, of two cylinders. I mean, that's fine. It could be a minus 4 cylinder axis 180 and a plus 1 cylinder axis 90. We'd achieve the same total power cross. Uh, we could write it out that way. We, we don't. Uh, but that is mathematically equivalent. What is the cylinder here in, in the total power course? The cylinder is the difference between the two arms. So in the case on the top, we're starting out, uh, I mean, with, with, with this case of minus 4 plus 5 axis 90, 
we're starting out with minus 4 as kind of our reference sphere. And then we're saying, well, we have to add plus 5 to it to get to that plus 1 arm. And uh, wh what is the axis? It's 90 because it's acting at 180. Well, we could do the opposite. We could say, well, let's take as our reference sphere the plus 1. And how do we get then to our, um, our other arm? the arm of minus 4. Well, what do we have to do to the plus 1? We have to add minus 5 to it. Where's the minus 5 acting? It's acting at 90, therefore its axis is at 180. Uh, so that's how we get the plus 1 minus 5 axis 180. Now, you guys know the uh, shortcut, which is to, when we transpose, we take the old sphere and we add the old cylinder to it to get the new sphere. So minus 4 plus 5 equals plus 1. We take the old cylinder and we change the sign, plus 5 becomes minus 5, and we rotate the axis by 90. But that's what we're doing when we do this transformation. Ooh, another special topic. This one is fluorescence. In fluorescence, um, there is an absorption of a high-energy photon. High energy means short wavelength, right? So a bluer photon. There are a couple of non-radiative transitions uh, that lower the energy uh, uh, of the electron that has absorbed uh, this photon. And then there is a drop down of the photon uh, towards its ground state. And that drop down is called fluorescence. And the, uh, because the energy uh, of the electron as it drops down to its ground state is less than the energy of the absorption because we've taken these non-radiative transition steps, the fluorescent wavelength is going to be longer. And we experience this clinically in uh, when we use fluorescein. So we expose the fluorescein to blue light, uh, which is uh, high energy, short wavelength, 490 or so nanometers. Uh, it absorbs the blue light, there are a couple of non-radiative transitions, and then it fluoresces in green, which is a longer wavelength. These non-radiative transitions are not literally instantaneous, but they may as well be. They occur very, very, very quickly. There is a very, very short time between the absorption uh, and the uh, fluorescent uh, radiation. Let's take something else. We can have absorption, and then rather than fluorescence, we can have a transition to a higher, a state of higher spin multiplicity. And then there is a forbidden transition. Well, forbidden doesn't mean that it can't happen. It just means that it's very improbable to, to happen. And improbable in the quantum world doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just means that it happens really slowly. Uh, so what happens is that there is an absorption and then there is this forbidden transition that takes its time and we call that phosphorescence. And what does phosphorescence mean to us? It means glow in the dark. That's why you charge up the glow in the dark with a, a short wavelength with a lot of light and then you can shut the lights off and it will continue to glow because of the time that is taken to make this forbidden transition. Okay, so we're still pumping with absorption, short wavelength, and uh, we could be fluorescing or we could be phosphorescing. We could also pump the electron from its ground state to the higher state, not with short wavelength light, but with chemicals. So this is chemical excitation and the equivalent to fluorescence that it produces is called chemiluminescence. And that's what we see in jellyfish. And that is what we see in fireflies. And this is the end of Act Two.